everyone. We're going to continue. Thank you so much for uh, for sticking with us. Uh, yeah, we're going to do the practical element now. Um, you're going to access this URL if you want to do it locally on your machine. There's more work to do as well. That's absolutely fine. But if you want to follow along and learn by by practically doing the the, the stuff alongside, just go to tinyurl.com forward slash today's date dash Midas. Okay. We'll, leave, we'll probably leave that up for like a minute or two so people can can get to it and then and we'll we'll do that as well. Oh, you're sharing. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, so if you're wanting to follow along, just go to this URL here, tinyurl.com uh, slash 112923-Midas. Um, if you know you don't want to follow around or uh, follow along now, but you want to take a look later and play around with it yourself, I think this will be posted on the website uh, for these sessions later, so you can always do that. Um, now, if you've come to this URL, what you're going to have to do, because uh, you will only have like viewing permission, uh, you're going to have to go to File, um, Save a Copy in Drive, and open the copy. Um, so, sorry, I'm blocking this URL. But uh, just, you know, File, Save a Copy in Drive to be able to run stuff on your own. And I'm hoping that this will work with uh, everyone's Google Colab. I tested it myself, but Google Colab can be unpredictable sometimes with uh, what it will let you do. Um, so if you have any issues, we'll try to troubleshoot them as, as, as they come along, but uh, I should at least be able to demonstrate on my side. Um, yeah, so I will give another few seconds to put this uh, URL in. By the way, does is the font here, like this font, readable for you all? I can zoom in a little bit more if needed. Okay, so I'm going to, yeah, I'll start diving into this now. Um, now, so basically, in the first half of the session, we covered a couple different ways uh, general techniques to apply your LLMs to some uh, specific uh, applications. Basically, how do we customize for our research solution? Um, so uh, those two ways were fine tuning and prompting. And I basically want to build some hands-on tools for you all to uh, start doing this yourself, go from theory to practice, because showing all these things on a slide is one thing, but then actually running it and doing it yourself, I think is uh, a whole lot more helpful sometimes. So um, yeah, we're gonna cover fine tuning, including uh, traditional, more traditional sense of fine tuning, um, and also low rank uh, adaptation or LoRa, um, which was sort of this matrix decomposition uh, sort of fine tuning uh, that we went over. Um, and we'll also go over prompting, including how can we use in context learning and uh, chain of thought, um, which were the last two tricks I, I showed on like the last couple slides. Uh, how can we use those to really maximize the, the abilities of these models to solve whatever tasks we have? Um, so the prerequisites, uh, in theory, for doing this are you know a little bit of Python and uh, ideally have a little bit of knowledge of machine learning with PyTorch. Um, the second one, it's fine if you don't because we're actually using the Hugging Face Hub for our experiments. Uh, and Hugging Face Hub is uh, the centralized resource that provides all sorts of useful things like data sets that you might commonly use in computational experiments, um, provides a lot of open source API, or not API, AI models, uh, such as GPT uh, models, such as BERT, um, and also all these helpful libraries that help you do all these things like uh, prompting models, loading data sets, doing this uh, parameter efficient fine tuning. Uh, making it really super easy to access and apply these LLMs, uh, even if you're like even a beginner in Python. Um, so, uh, and also just a, a content warning, just in case this tutorial involves interacting with AI language models, um, especially these, uh, we're using kind of smaller earlier ones that don't have as many guardrails as some of the newer ones do. And they are capable to generate harmful and offensive content. And we're certainly not trying to generate any harmful and offensive content, but I ran into some weird uh, weird cases when I was building this uh, talk. So uh, just, just to let you all know, it's a possibility. Um, and I certainly do not stand behind anything that's generated by these models. Um, but hopefully we'll be okay, because we're doing quite 
just uh, simple, uh, uh, simple language tasks. Nothing, uh, nothing too intense. Um, so, is there anyone who still needs this URL, or is it okay if I move on? Raise your hand, I guess, if you need it. Cool. Um, all right, so the first thing we have to do is set up our environment. We're using Google Colab, which is nice because it's free, and it comes with several uh, pre-installed Python libraries for easy setup. By the way, if you uh, press play on this uh, environment setup thing, uh, it might ask, uh, do you trust this notebook? Uh, you, can, you can trust it, it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it's easy to set up. I'm going to quickly install some packages that we need by running this cell. Um, but, uh, oh, actually, this, there might be one thing I have to show you all. Um, so, notice how in the upper right corner of Colab here, uh, it says T4 for me, right? Yours should also say T4 here. Um, and how you can actually check, it might, if it doesn't say anything, uh, you can go to, sorry, I'll show this clearer, runtime, change runtime type. Make sure yours says T4 GPU. That's what you want right now. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to get a lot of your stuff to work. Um, so let's double check we're in T4 GPU. Um, if you weren't before and like uh, you have to change it, you can just press save. Um, and then it will probably restart your environment. And you'll have to press play on this one more time, but that's OK. Um, just want to make sure we do that before suddenly everyone's uh, running out of memory or something in Colab. Um, because, okay, so I told you, advantage of Colab, we're using it because it's free, easy to access, um, it's good for settings like this, but uh, the disadvantage is the computing resources are very limited and strict, and if you run stuff for too long, it's going to just cut you off and say, nope, you've used too much, you're done. Um, so it's usually not suitable for extended experiments, um, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about what are the alternatives to Colab that you might want to use. Um, but okay, so I've installed some packages uh, that we're going to need. These are all from Hugging Face. Most of them are from Hugging Face or are meant to uh, work with Hugging Face. Um, now, let's scroll down to fine tuning uh, LMs. By the way, if like you find I'm just moving way too fast, feel free to just raise your hand, ask a question, let me know. Um, it's, this is my first time giving this kind of uh, interactive demo presentation, so we'll learn together how to make this work. Um, so we have fine-tuning language models first. I already showed this figure earlier, but basically um, the idea behind fine-tuning is we can customize an LM for a specific task for which we already have a substantial amount of training data. Uh, what we're going to do today is fine-tune GPT-2, which was a, a few iterations before GPT-4. Uh, um, because it's, uh, you know, it's smaller, it's only about 125 million learned parameters, we can fit it in the GPUs that Colab will give us. Um, and so it's more feasible. We'll play with this. It's not the best model we could possibly use, but um, I think this is a good example for uh, just building sort of your ideas of how to interact with these models. Um, so, okay. Um, first thing we have to do is load a data set. What is the problem we're going to work on? Um, so I'm going to use sentiment analysis again because I've already showed several examples of sentiment uh, analysis. Basically, text classification task where we need the system to judge whether a text is positive or negative. Um, and in order to uh, get a data set um, for this problem, uh, a set of data that you know is already labeled with all this stuff, uh, we'll just use the data sets package to uh, download the SST2 data set. Um, this is a common sentiment analysis uh, benchmark sort of a task. It's already, it has thousands of examples of, uh, I think, movie reviews mostly that, or chunks of movie reviews that are labeled for whether they're positive or negative. Um, so yeah, well, that'll take a few seconds to do. It might take you longer than me. So I guess, uh, do you, I guess, thumbs up? Did it download for you all? Any issues? Cool. Um, another thing that we're going to do is, um, oh, well, actually, this is really just to show you some examples of the data. This is nothing special. If you press play on this cell, it should show you a couple uh, examples of this uh, from this data set. Uh, you can see it's a charming and affecting journey is a positive sentiment, has a one label, uh, whereas unflinchingly bleak and desperate has a zero label. Um, so these are the types of la pieces of language that we're going to try to train a text classifier for using LMs. Um, 
so, and yes, this is just one task. This is an example. Uh, I'm hoping that this will get you all thinking about what types of tasks do you want to train language models on? Um, you know, there might be token classification or even text generation based tasks you want to apply them to, but text classification is a good starter one because it's kind of the simplest type of task. Um, so now we're going to load a pre-trained language model. Uh, so uh, what we can do is use these helper functions that uh, are called like auto model, auto tokenizer. Um, and basically what this will let us do is load GPT-2 only by providing a string, GPT-2. Um, so if I press play on this, this might take a, a few minutes. So um, I say press play now um, and I'll keep talking. So it's gonna download the parameters of GPT-2 onto your Google Drive. Um, in fact, if you go to um, here, it's quite possible, I guess I don't, no, actually you should be fine. You shouldn't have to provide any extra permissions to allow that to download. Um, so it, it will take a few seconds. Um, does that seem to be working? Did it finish running? Awesome. So uh, what we did here was we loaded a tokenizer, which is a module that will turn text into tokens. Basically, it will take any string of text and convert it into the units of words that the language model is actually trained on. We'll go a little bit more into that in a second. Um, we also learned, uh, we loaded a model for sequence classification, a text classification model. Um, and what does that mean? Basically, this would be a model that um, has a, has a pre-trained language model plus some layer to apply it to text classification. Um, you might have noticed this warning showed up when we loaded the model and it said, oh, some weights were not initialized. And that is what we expect because if we want to train a new layer, um, in fact, uh, when we ran this code, it added an extra uninitialized sort of layer that we're gonna have to train. Um, so that's expected, that's normal, don't worry about that. Um, and we can also confirm sort of this architecture just by printing it out. So you can go to the next cell and press play on it. Um, and it will print out this lovely little um, sort of chart uh, list of all the parts of the model. Because most of it's not gonna make much sense, but you can see that there's a transformer. We have this GPT-2 pre-trained model. And then we also have this module called SCORE, which is just a feed-forward neural network layer. Um, and is basically going to take the uh, input embeddings from GPT-2, which are uh, vectors of 768 numbers, and convert it to a vector of two numbers for positive or negative, sorry, um, positive or negative. Um, and then you'll see the in this whole architecture, this is how many trainable parameters there are. That's, um, what is that? Commas, uh, 124 million uh, parameters. So we're gonna be training this whole architecture end to end, all these 124 million parameters. Um, so, uh, by the way, if, if you're curious, I'm gonna play with this more, make sure you check out all these notes. I'm gonna gloss over most of them probably, but um, these are just notes for when you're looking back later on your own, we'll give you some pointers on what do you do next? How do you do other things besides what I'm showing you? Um, so next let's go to what is the basics of interacting with these uh, LLMs. So we can test out the tokenizer first with a simple prompt just to see how it works. Um, so let's say I just made up this text. This is the most uninteresting movie I've ever seen to find it as a string in Python. If I pass it into the tokenizer, you can see it gives me a list of numbers. Um, input IDs is basically the, the indices in the language model's uh, sort of vocabulary of uh, what are all these different words that you just gave to it. So this list of numbers is representing your list of words. If you decode and go back uh, to strings, um, you'll see what each of the tokens actually is. So like you can see, oh, this is the most uninteresting um, movie I've ever seen, period. You can see how tokenization kind of breaks things up a bit different from what you would expect. Like uh, words are not necessarily the same as tokens. Sometimes a word could be multiple tokens. Um, so uh, just to keep in mind when you're working with these models sort of hands-on. Um, now, after tokenizing a sentence, we can pass it into the model. Our model's not really fully initialized, so we're not gonna get much out of this, but this is the code you would use to do that. Um, and uh, you can probably get some scores to come out of the model. These are the two scores for negative, positive, but the model hasn't been trained yet. Um, but what we're gonna do, I guess, is uh, these scores are not like a probability distribution at this point. These are just sort of numbers that were spat out of the neural network. 
uh, what you do have to do if you want to do some kind of classification task with a, a finite set of labels is use this softmax function, which basically turns any list of numbers into a probability distribution, makes them add up to one. Um, in this, now you can see, oh, well the model is maybe 95% uh, confident that it was positive. But of course, the model has not been trained on the task yet, so it has no idea uh, really what the text means. Um, but uh, just these little chunks of code are to give you some ideas on how do I throw stuff into the model and how do I get answers out of the model. Um, so, right. Um, another thing you can do uh, is maybe worth noting is, uh, and actually, yeah, uh, spend more time with this uh, later, but I guess uh, if you are familiar with machine learning already and you know the idea of like a loss function, which is like the sort of objective we use to optimize neural networks, um, these uh, hugging face models, like this GPT-2 for sequence classification that we already uh, ported in, they come with uh, loss functions built into them. So uh, if your model is for text classification, it already has uh, some element in it that says, I need to use cross entropy loss. Um, and if you want to calculate loss, you can run this uh, cell. It doesn't really matter. But um, that's, if you're already familiar with like PyTorch and machine learning, that's good to know because you can build your own uh, sort of training procedures with knowing that. Um, the next thing we have to do is pre-process our data. We already downloaded our data but um, we need to get it ready to put into the language model. Um, so normally uh, what we would do is use all the available data for fine tuning the LM. I think there's, oh, I forget. There's at least tens of thousands of examples in this SST2 data sets training partition of the data. Um, but the problem is, is if, I, if we did use all of them, we would be standing, I'd be standing up here for like 45 minutes watching the model train and it would not be very interesting. So what we're gonna do is uh, this step, you don't usually have to do it, but for the sake of demonstration, we're gonna downsample our training data to just a thousand examples. So when you run that example, uh, run that cell, uh, oh, 67,000 examples is how many are in the training data. Um, you can run this cell and it will turn your training data into just a set of a thousand examples that were randomly selected. Um, this is something you usually can disregard though. Um, now, uh, so another thing to note, when you're playing around with publicly shared benchmark data sets like SST2, they often will have some chunk of the data that's for testing models and a lot of times they don't give you labels for that. Um, in fact, they probably expect you to like send your model to them and then they evaluate it for you and then they have a leaderboard and all of this. Um, SST2 uh, is one of these data sets that does this. So uh, instead of just not having a test partition, we're gonna uh, run this cell to kind of uh, pull out some of the validation data to be our testing examples. Um, so um, I guess if we're not familiar with what these uh, different types of data are, like training, testing, validation, I can give a quick, quick explanation. Basically, training data, we use to train the model. The model will learn from this chunk of our data, of this chunk of our movie reviews that are labeled. Validation data is what we use to evaluate the model's performance as we're training it. We do this to kind of see how well is it learning. Um, and also like how general, ge how, yeah, how general is it learning what we're wanting to learn? Because if we just evaluated it on the training data that it's also learning from, it's not a great test. It's kind of like we have to give like an exam that was not seen. Uh, we haven't already seen all the questions on the homework. Um, then uh, testing data uh, we use for kind of a totally separate held out evaluation that uh, we basically, we didn't use this for any part of our training, for any part of selecting what was the best way that this model should be trained. Um, so training, validation, testing. Um, that's just, if you haven't taken like a machine learning or data science course before, those terms might not be familiar. Um, so I did run this, right? Yeah, okay. So next we can jump down to here where now we're gonna tokenize the whole data set. So all of those movie reviews that we have, we're gonna turn them into tokens. Um, so we have to run this cell and uh, you'll see I printed out kind of like the shapes of the different uh, matrices that came out of this. Um, so you can kind of see, all right, there's a thousand training examples, 400 validation, uh, 472 testing. One thing that we did when we used the tokenizer this time that we didn't do before was uh, we had to do padding. Uh, which basically means we want to run a bunch of data through our language model at the same time, but uh, 
language models do not like if you put a bunch of different uh, sentences that are different lengths in them all at the same time. So you have to kind of add a bunch of dummy words to the end of all the sentences so they're the same length. Um, it's just a, a little architectural quirk that, um, in case you were wondering why we're doing it a bit differently now, that's why. Um, so how are we doing? Is everyone like caught up at this point? Okay, so we've tokenized. Another thing we have to do is create kind of a special helper class for text classification. This is just something that Hugging Face makes you do because it really wants you to pass in a torch dataset object. Um, you can probably reuse this class for your own applications if you're doing text classification. Um, but basically, you're gonna take all these tokenized data sets and put them into this class. Um, and it's as simple as that, really. Now this class kind of has all of your tokens, all of your labels, all of that. Um, so our data set is now ready. Um, so now we'll move on to fine tuning. Um, oh good, we're doing pretty good on time too. So let's jump into fine tuning. For simplicity, we're gonna use what's called the trainer uh, from Hugging Face to fine tune GPT-2. This is um, basically like uh, in a class that Hugging Face made for us where we basically can just write a couple lines of code and fine tune a language model. And this kind of alleviates some of this uh, sort of technical skills and engineering that you'd usually have to do. Um, but then it's worth noting, if you're already quite comfortable with PyTorch, you can also apply like a traditional training loop like you would normally do in PyTorch uh, to fine tune the model. That would work just the same uh, because uh, Hugging Face is very well integrated with PyTorch. Um, so, okay, uh, when we go to fine tuning, the first thing we might want to do is define a bunch of arguments for our training procedure. Um, and Hugging Face has this sort of object. We have to put them all in. Um, and this includes what are called hyperparameters. Um, so what are hyperparameters? These are basically numerical properties of the training procedure that uh, we have to define, and they might affect the final results. Um, so these are numbers like the learning rate. How fast are we gonna learn from the training data? Um, how fast is our optimizer going to uh, try to do gradient descent uh, using our loss function and so on? Um, there's also like how many epochs do we wanna train the model for? Um, and epochs, all that means is how many times is it going to see the training data during training? Um, if the number is 10, that means it's going to loop through all of my training data 10 times to learn from it. Um, there's also things like batch size, which is like how many pieces of data do we want the model to see at once during training? And that's usually uh, decided based on how much GPU memory you have. Um, but uh, basically, all these things uh, you have to define. I've chosen some good values for you already, so you don't have to worry about it. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what went into choosing them in a, in a bit. Um, so we can go ahead and run this cell to define the training arguments. It might take a few seconds if it's your first time running it. Everyone good? Okay, so we've done this. Um, and by the way, I left little comments to kind of explain all these parameters. I'm not going to jump into all of them right now, but if, if you're curious, read through them. Um, so uh, another thing we have to do is that this trainer class does not return common classification metrics like accuracy, percentage accuracy by default. Um, so we can define, we have to define a custom metrics function to do this. Um, so basically just make a Python function that returns a dictionary of metrics given uh, this object uh, that has all the predictions in it. Um, basically this function's inputs are the ground truth labels and the LM's predictions. And uh, given those, we just want to return some dictionary full of metrics. In this case, we'll use all the normal classification metrics like accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I won't go into what all those are. If you're not familiar with accuracy, it's just basically uh, what percent of the time was the model correct in classifying and choosing a label. But uh, um, yeah, the, that's sort of what you have to do here. I have to make sure make sure we run this. Um, and you can probably reuse this if you're gonna do text classification again later. Um, so now we're ready to fine tune the LM and it really only takes a couple lines of code. Um, I'm hoping, uh, hoping this works. Uh, we've already set everything up and all we have to do is create the trainer, pass in all these arguments of the training data set, the evaluation data set, and say trainer.train. Um, so let's see what happens when I do it. 
it's working, good. So you'll see as it's training, and it's gonna take about five minutes, so I'm gonna talk while it runs. You can watch it run, make sure it doesn't crash, and raise your hand if anything bad happens, uh, if it you know suddenly crashes and says error or something happened. Um, what you'll see as this is training is um, you have all these like losses here that are being uh, listed in a table. The training loss is like, um, well, okay, so loss in general, when I use this word, this is basically some kind of continuous quantitative measure to tell me how close the LM's outputs are to the ground truth correct labels for our task. So if I have a very high loss, that means it's not quite outputting the right labels yet for uh, my sentiment analysis task. And uh, we use that measure to basically um, do some like calculus tricks and gradient descent and all this stuff we won't get into. But um, in general, what you want to observe when you're looking at these losses um, is you wanna see that your training loss continuously decreases through training. Um, and your validation loss will probably mostly decrease through training, but then eventually it should stop decreasing or even start increasing. Um, and I'll show you visually what this looks like in a bit. Um, but what this will indicate is convergence, they say, of the model. Basically, the model learned as much transferable knowledge as it can from your training data, and it can apply what it learned to successfully tackle the, your validation data set and produce some labels for that validation data. Um, so if your model's not converging, uh, these are some rules of thumbs to diagnose the problem. Um, if you start really digging into fine tuning your own models, this is, these rules of thumb will become very important. Like, um, so the first thing you'll wanna keep in mind is if your training loss is not decreasing or it's decreasing like super slowly, you're gonna need to increase your learning rate. That's one of those hyperparameters that I defined in the beginning. Um, and usually, like I said, usually we have to do a bit of work to find the best hyperparameters. This is why I gave you some decent ones to start with. Um, furthermore, if your training loss is increasing or it's jumping around, meaning it seems like the model's not learning anything from the training data, it's just all over the place, your learning rate's probably too high and you should lower it. Um, and uh, lastly, if your training loss is decreasing, but your validation loss is increasing or it's jumping around, um, then this means your model might be overfitting, they call it, which means your model's learning the training data super, super well to where it only knows the training data and it can't tackle other examples of sentiment analysis that you're giving it. It's just memorizing all the training data, basically. Um, so when this happens, it might help to lower the learning rate. In general, we have techniques in our neural networks to avoid this happening too often, um, including like regularization techniques, they call it uh, like dropout. Uh, basically, as we're training the model, it's randomly zeroing out weights within the model to um, help it kind of not get too comfortable learning only the training data because uh, any, any of these weights could disappear at any time. But, um, yeah, so those are some kind of tricks and uh, rules of thumb. Let's see where my training is. It looks like it's almost done. Everyone's still training, looking good. Well, it looks like we are wrapping up now. Okay, so um, in this table, by the way, uh, you can see the training and validation losses, how they're changing, whatever. You can also see all of our classification metrics that we defined, like accuracy. You can see that the accuracy is actually going up to about 89% uh, as we're training the models. The model is learning sentiment analysis. It's learning how to classify these uh, chunks of text as positive or negative quite well. Um, so uh, is everyone seeing like that kind of trend in accuracy, like it's going up? It's, uh, hopefully you do. These, there is randomness involved in training neural networks, so it's not always guaranteed that you will, but it probably looks something like this. Your numbers might look a, uh, a bit different than mine, though, um, but you'll see a general trend like this. Okay, I think mine's finished. Everyone else is finished. Um, so what we can do, let's uh, observe, let's look and see did our model converge? Um, and hopefully this looks how it did when I tested it, so it, <laughs> it's clear. Yes, so this is exactly what we wanna see when we're training the model, right? We have our training loss, this blue curve, and our validation loss, this orange curve. So what this shows us is that the loss on the training set went down, 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 down as we trained. That's exactly what we want because 
uh, our optimizer, that's all it's trying to do is uh, minimize the loss on the training data. Meanwhile, we saw that the validation loss went down to a point and then it started going up again. Um, so what does that mean? That just means that after this point, you're starting to kind of overfit the data. Um, and this is sort of, this is the point where you want. This is like a convergence. This is what you like to see. Um, because you've maximized, or you've uh, rather minimized your validation loss, uh, thus maximizing your accuracy. It's kind of confusing because the, the numbers go in different directions. But um, you've minimized your validation loss uh, as good as you can. And that basically means your model has learned all it can from the training data, and it's still good. Uh, on the validation data as well. It can actually tackle things besides exactly what it was trained on. Um, so has everyone seen something kind of like this? It might not look exactly like this. Cool, so we fine-tuned a language model. That's, um, th this is the hardest part of this uh, tutorial. So if, uh, if you feel like that was a lot, that's good because it's, I think the, the later parts are a little bit easier. Um, so another thing we're gonna do is uh, evaluate. Let's just uh, take our model our best model, basically our model that we had at this point, uh, our trainer saved it, um, or not at that point, rather at this point. Um, our, mo our trainer saved it, so all we have to do is call trainer.evaluate and evaluate on the test data set, and it will quickly tell us uh, the accuracy on the test data set is about 86%. So this model's pretty good, it's generalizing. Um, we didn't use the test data set at all to sort of uh, uh, evaluate our model during training, and yet, here we are, it looks good. It's uh, learned, learned the task pretty well. Um, so, okay, that's your basic fine tuning sort of process. Um, now, what I wanna talk a second about is hyperparameter search. I'm not going to run all this code. You're welcome to run it on your own. But, um, cause it, it will take several minutes. So you probably don't wanna run it here. Um, but basically, like I said before, we manually selected all of our hyperparameters, like our learning rate and our batch size. But for the best results, we probably wanna do like a systematic search over a bunch of different possible values. Um, and one thing that people commonly do is a grid search. Uh, so one thing we can do is like a grid search over the learning rate and the batch size. Like say, um, we'll have to define a function uh, to uh, basically, uh, define this space of hyperparameter, hyperparameters we're searching over. So learning rate, batch size, let's say we wanna look at five different values of each. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go super deep into this. So this is what you'd really have to do. You basically end up doing that fine tuning thing we just did 25 different times and then choosing the best model out of it. And uh, by doing that, you can usually get uh, slightly better results. Um, but yeah, that's just an example for I guess your later experiments. Um, another thing I wanted to do, just because it's kind of handy, is uh, this low rank adaptation. So uh, we can use similar code uh, to uh, do low rank adaptation. Um, so the advantage of this is now we can do faster and lower memory fine tuning by freezing the pre-trained uh, LM parameters, and uh, we learn the weight updates as a decomposition of the weight update matrix. Um, so I already showed this a little bit ago, but um, yeah, uh, I guess, what we're gonna see with GPT, I'm gonna use GPT-2 again, but in theory, we could even uh, train an even bigger LM because we're using this approach. But uh, yeah, so we can run this first cell here, which basically is going to uh, load up a PEFT model in Hugging Face. Um, and what this means is, is basically loading up the same architecture as before, but we're going to learn these weird um, decomposed matrix uh, matrices instead of one big weight update. Um, and that should only take a few seconds to run. Uh, did that work well for everyone? Cool, so same, same stuff as before. In fact, we're gonna use the same code as before to fine tune and evaluate the model. So this next cell is basically just compiling uh, all the setup steps we did before. I'm not gonna linger too much on them because we've already seen them all. We saw, we did the training arguments, we defined the metrics um, and all of that. So you can press play on this cell and it will take no time to run. Um, and then we fine tune the model uh, and it will, again, just call trainer.train. It's quite, uh, it's very simple with this hugging face stuff. Um, so hopefully things are still working for people. And uh, this is going to take a little bit faster to train. Um, Oh, I don't want to show the spoilers for how, how much faster, but uh, you'll see, it will be a bit faster. I actually don't have anything to talk about for these two minutes, so I'm just gonna stare at it and drink water, so don't mind me. I 
one thing we can still notice is that these losses, just the same, are going down. Uh, our accuracy, just the same, is going up. But I don't know, if you were paying uh, close attention before, each epoch was a lot slower than uh, this is. This is actually, uh, the epochs are running a lot faster now. Um, so yeah, within, I think, within like another minute or so, it should be done running. Any questions in the meantime while I wait? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good questions. So I guess um, the question was like, we we just picked the model with the lowest validation loss. At times, that might not be exactly what we want to do. Um, and so the reason we did this is because we defined in our training arguments load best model at end, like here. Um, and that's just what automatically happened. It's kind of convenient to do that. But then um, if you want to get a different checkpoint, we call it, of your model, actually, uh, you might notice uh, Hugging Face is saving all your checkpoints here. So you can, um, actually, I probably don't have a code sample to show you how to load it. But basically, everything's saved. So you can load it and use it just the same. Um, and then the. What was the, oh yeah, the second question was about um, what if I have multiple sort of objectives, or no, n rather, what if I have multiple epochs where um, my validation loss is like the same, right? Um, that's sort of like an art or like a, yeah, that's like a, a judgment call kind of thing. Um, sometimes you might want to pick like the one with lower training loss, uh, or no, higher training loss, sorry, because it's maybe less overfit to your training data. Um, sometimes you might have multiple objectives that you're optimizing your model for. Like say, you're not only looking at accuracy, but you're looking at, um, I don't know what else you might look at, F1 score or something. You might say, okay, well, let's pick the one with the highest accuracy from on the validation data, but then um, if there's a tie in accuracy, pick the one with the highest F1 score. And if there's a tie in F1 score, pick the one with the lowest loss. So it's like if you have ties, you can kind of break them by having multiple sort of objectives uh, to yeah choose, choose your model based on. Does that make sense? Yeah, so when you download the pre-trained model, where it goes here is um, basically Google Colab keeps like a temporary file system. So it will download it within this file system. You can also mount your Google Drive to Colab and say, actually put it here instead in my Google Drive. It will do that for you. In like the general setting, if you're like doing this on your own server or something else, um, it will download it to some hidden directories like off of your home directory. Um, so yeah, it does exist somewhere on the machine you're using, whether it's like, I guess it just depends on what type of environment you're in. Okay, so by now, I think our model should be fine-tuned. Yes, so we can see that um, through these 10 epochs of LoRa-based training, we got to about, close enough, the same validation accuracy uh, as we uh, had before without LoRa. And it ran a lot faster. Uh, I think I talked for longer than it, but it only took about two minutes to run. Uh, it took a minute, 46 seconds. So this is a really nice trick if you have a lot of training data and you need to save time, or you know you want to train, you want to fine tune a bigger language model than what uh, your hardware would usually be able to fine tune. Um, use, use LoRa, it's quite good. Um, then again, we can test the model and it should hopefully get about the same level of testing accuracy. Yeah, about 86% accuracy on the testing data. So this LoRa trick only takes a few extra lines of code. It maybe is a bit less intuitive, but um, 
you know, it saves you a lot of time, saves you hardware, memory, all of that. So I'd recommend uh, going for that if you can. Um, yes, so I already said all these things. So that's it on fine tuning. We're gonna move to prompting, but are there any questions on fine tuning before we move on? This is kind of like the simplest example, by the way, I can give. I think uh, as you start digging in more, you'll find more complicated examples, depending on what hardware you have too, is really going to dictate what you're able to do with these LMs. Yes. Um, so I think the question is like, what kinds of uh, configuration do we have to do on low rank adaptation? Or is it all just decided for us? So like, to some degree it's decided for us because your language model like GPT-2 already has 120 million uh, parameters and LoRa is just going to decompose that matrix of weights into two smaller matrices. Um, but then there are some hyper parameters in LoRa as well like, oh, what is the dimension of these matrices that can kind of dictate um, how decomposed <laughs> you're going to have, have your weights. So um, actually in this, uh, somewhere up here, let me see. When we set up our PEFT model, we had to define some parameters like this uh, alpha and this um, R. These are parameters of LoRa. Uh, you probably wanna read their paper to see exactly what they mean. But the idea is kind of like these are scaling uh, and dimension sort of uh, parameters that uh, might dictate the size of your uh, LoRa matrix, your decomposition. Um, but beyond that, uh, the rest of it is just kind of automatic. Cool, so there is your simple example of fine tuning. Um, now we can jump to prompting. Um, so let me see. So yeah, we already are familiar with the advantages of prompting. We're going to use a slightly larger language model now because usually you have to have a larger language model for it to be any good in this setting. Um, we're gonna use a 6.7 billion parameter instance of what's called OPT. Um, it's basically GPT, but the O is for like open source. So um, it's an open source version of GPT. Um, so we've already seen these figures, but um, so the tool we're gonna use this time is called Hugging Face Pipelines. Um, and uh, this will allow us to easily prompt LMs, uh, pre-trained LMs for common purposes without even doing as much work as we did in the previous part where we had to interface with the model and tokenize and all this stuff. This, this, uh, these pipelines will make it even easier. And I just wanted to show you uh, this part too because it's um, it might speed you up if you only care about prompting. Um, so hopefully this runs. Um, people might have memory issues trying to run this cell, but let's see what happens. Also, this might take uh, several seconds to run um, because it has to download kind of a large language model. Um, yeah, like seven billion parameter uh, language model. So press play if you haven't already. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really hoping Colab doesn't kick any of you out <laughs> in the middle of this. I, I've been able to get it to run fine, but um, I, I really never know. Also, if you already use Colab a lot, you could run into issues. Um, but okay, so this is gonna take a couple minutes to run. So what I'm gonna do is actually jump down to the very last cell. We're not gonna run anything, so you don't have to jump down really. Um, you might be curious about Okay, we're using Colab, and I keep complaining about Colab, but what other option do we have, right? Um, so this table at the end I'm hoping is useful. It might not be, but uh, it's a quick comparison of different kinds of computing platforms you might use to fine tune LMs or host them in order to prompt them. Um, so this would, uh, there are a few factors that I think are important for this. Um, you know, cost. How much does it cost to use the LM? Uh, what we're doing right now is free, but how much does it cost to get more computational resources and so on? Um, availability of the hardware or the hosted uh, language models. How much, you know, what is the limit of the hardware I can get access to in my service or the biggest language model I can get access to? Um, that's another important thing. Uh, data privacy is also an important thing. If you're working on a project that has like sensitive data, you can't just uh, send that all to ChatGPT. Uh, that will get you into trouble. So um, 
uh, another thing is like, what is the performance of the LMs that are possible to use with this service? Um, like, we all know that GPT-4 is like amazing and really good, uh, but you can only access GPT-4 through OpenAI services. Um, then uh, I guess flexibility is another thing that I have in mind. Like if you really are an advanced user and you want to control exactly what architectures you're using, what uh, specific tasks, formulations, templates, if there's a lot of stuff you're trying to configure yourself, you might prioritize flexibility of this interface. Meanwhile, if you're just uh, maybe using it to write, uh, using GPT-4 to write a recommendation letter or assist in writing a recommendation letter, you might not care about that. You just want to use the, the interface, right? Um, Uh-oh, my session crashed. Okay. It might be better now that it's uh, restarted. I think what we can do... So if anyone else had a crash, we're just gonna try to do the same thing again, but I think it will be better because now it's uh, erased all of our fine tuning stuff from earlier. So go all the way back up to the top and we're just gonna have to run setting up environment one more time and we can jump back down to the prompting part. Yeah, hopefully this works. Otherwise I do have a backup plan, but um, yeah, okay, so you can run the, uh, run this uh, setup cell. It will take a few seconds. By the way, I think um, it says online the session ends at 4.30. I'm probably going to go until about five given the pace we're at. So, I mean, if, if you're available and wanna stick around, stick around. Otherwise, I won't be offended if you have somewhere to go. Um, so, okay, back down to this prompting part. Hopefully, we can get this to work. Um, okay, yeah, so this is, again, probably gonna take uh, a couple minutes to run, but um, it actually could be faster this time, though, because it might have already gotten through the step of downloading the model and now is just um, trying to set up this pipeline object that I was talking about. But while I wait for that, I'll finish my uh, thoughts here. The other factor you might be interested in when it comes to choosing your computing platform is ease. Like how easy is it to do this? Some of this stuff might be quite complicated. Maybe you just want to uh, use ChatGPT's interface and uh, talk to it back and forth. Um, so these are all different sorts of important factors. I tried to summarize them in this table on like, you know, uh, what would I choose under, or, you know, uh, what are different reasons I would choose different platforms? I think uh, for fine tuning, uh, you're probably, a lot of you will want to use like Great Lakes, which is a service offered by uh, Umish. Um, or if you, uh, I guess that's one possibility. Um, that also gives you maybe the most flexibility, but then there's also like Maisy, which is a recent service offered by uh, ITS where they'll fine tune a language model for you. Um, uh, I think for a lot of cases too, you might just want to use proprietary APIs. The problem is these are expensive. Um, but anyway, uh, tried to kind of summarize uh, summarize uh, sort of the pros and cons of each of these. Our lab uh, kind of has like a multi uh, multimodal. I don't know. We have many of these different uh, avenues available to us depending on the circumstances. For most cases, we're using Great Lakes to fine tune language models. We can host some language models to prompt them. Um, we also do use the proprietary APIs in some cases, especially if we wanna like generate some really good data and so on. Um, uh, and then cloud providers like AWS and so on, you can get all kinds of resources from them, but then they are super expensive. So I'd recommend going the route of like Great Lakes before you do cloud providers like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure. Um, just because Great Lakes, um, even though it does have a cost, um, if you're a research faculty member, you have access to UMRCP, which basically the uh, ITS people who run, um, or I think they're actually called ARC, Advanced Research Computing. Uh, the people who run uh, Great Lakes will give you like a budget of free computing credits uh, that you can use in your research. So um, definitely, I guess, if you're trying to figure out how to set up uh, your infrastructure for this in your own research. Um, have a look here. Feel free to uh, reach out to me if you have any questions about it too. Um, I'm happy to help. Um, okay, so did everyone's pipeline like successfully happen now? Uh, for me it did. Cool, so 
yeah, I think what just happened is we ran one thing and then ran the next thing and ran out of memory, where realistically I should have restarted in between these two parts, uh, restarted our, our session on Colab. Um, but okay, so pipelines make it very easy to generate text with LMs. And if you're gonna use like a proprietary API like GPT-3 or GPT-4, uh, your code will kind of look similar to this too. It's really nice. You just have like one quick line of code. I could do something like, oh, the University of Michigan is blank and let the model generate something. And uh, it says something like this. University of Michigan is the only school in the Big Ten that has never had a Heisman winner. I do not know if that's true. It's probably not true, honestly. But <laughs> um, that's, uh, I guess, that's how, that's the basic uh, building block, the basic tool for interacting with these models. Um, now, I want to teach you some of the tips and tricks that you're going to have to keep in mind when you're using these models. Um, the first is about temperature. So temperature is this parameter you use when you prompt language models. Um, it's a number between zero and one that will be used by the decoding algorithm it's called. Basically the algorithm that decides based on the language model's probability distribution, um, what words to spit out. Um, the decoding algorithm that most of these models are using now has a little bit of randomness so that there's some diversity when it's generating language. Again, this is why like ChatGPT will say something different every time you give it the same prompt. Um, so a zero temperature is what you want if uh, factuality is important because this means zero randomness. Um, whereas a non-zero temperature, uh, the bigger it is, the more randomness. Um, and a higher temperature is probably better for tasks where you want diverse outputs, like when you want like a, a chat bot or something like that or um, any kind of creative task. High temperature I think is okay. Um, I would say if you are using LLMs in research, empirical studies and stuff like that, you do have to be really careful about accounting for randomness and language generation when you interpret your results because uh, like when you're interpreting any random variable, I guess you have to <laughs> be aware if your differences in your, in your results that you're seeing are statistically significant and so on. Um, so let's look at the role of temperature on a few different problems. Um, the first is math. Um, now using language models to do math is a bit weird, I'll admit, but um, this is just, I guess, the simplest example I could think of. So in math problems, we know factuality is important. Um, one plus one always equals two. That's not something we can just randomly perturb, right? Um, so if we generate with this model, uh, one plus one equals, it will output two. That's easy, right? Um, but if we set the temperature to one, and when you do set the temperature to one, by the way, you also have to put this uh, variable in do sample equals true. Um, and that just uh, basically is a flag to tell the decoding algorithm, yes, you do have to put some randomness in this generation. Um, when you do that, you probably get something wacky. Oh, this time I did get two. Um, so this said two, but then it generated a bunch of other text. If you run it again, um, I got one that time, like it, it will just say whatever. Yeah, you can keep pressing uh, play on it and you'll get a bunch of different answers. And this is not the type of problem where you want a bunch of different answers. So um, math, I guess that's, that's an idea of what you would do with math. Um, translation, like translating languages, factuality is also important. Um, so a non-zero temperature, uh, actually, I think I meant to say non-zero temperature is probably not suitable. You probably want a zero temperature. But on the other hand, if you are translating a very long sentence where um, you know things may or may not get lost in translation and so on, things are open to interpretation, then a slightly larger temperature can be okay. I'm using a very simple sentence here. Like if I do the sentence, I love my dog, I can get the correct answer if temperature is zero. If it's one though, um, no, this time I actually kind of got the right answer. They forgot to capitalize hund, but um, yeah, you can kind of uh, see, you get just a lot of random stuff when you, you're trying to translate, you want the right answer. It's kind of a balance, I think. Uh, you have to kind of walk and troubleshoot. Um, so that's translation. Uh, now text generation. If we're just doing like free form text generation, like we want to generate dialogue or stories, um, a zero temperature is actually going to be kind of problematic now. Um, so here's what happens if I, I basically gave a prompt that is like the start of a dialogue. A says hello, B says what? Now <laughs> the dialogue is not at all interesting, not at all helpful. Um, if, this was chat, if this is what chat GPT did uh, when you tried to talk to it, you might be a bit irritated um, because it just starts with zero temperature, there's no randomness. It just starts generating the same thing over and over and over again. Um, this is the sort of behavior you can see uh, in this type of task with zero temperature. 
Then on the other hand, if you pass a one temperature, the highest possible temperature, you're sacrificing coherence probably. Um, so <laughs> you get a dialogue that's a bit wacky. Uh, hello, have you seen my husband? No, have you seen my husband? No, do you have my husband? No, like this doesn't really make much sense. <laughs> um, you guys, if you ran it as well, you probably saw something else that was funny too. Um, but then like something between zero and one is probably the best choice for this sort of task. And uh, I could take this back after I run this because I, I don't know what's going to um, be. You know, this actually isn't great, but it is a little bit better. <laughs> it says, hello, I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused too. I thought you were gonna be on a vacation. I am, I, I don't know. It's slightly more coherent. <laughs> when I tested it myself, it, I actually got something coherent. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you can kind of start to see there's like a balance. Higher temperature, the more wacky things you get. Lower temperature, you get kind of redundant, boring. Like, I think the ideal is somewhere in the middle. I don't know if I've found it here. Maybe some of you got better results than I did, but uh, I can give you some ideas. Um, so yeah, it's always a line you walk when you're trying to do prompting, like what's the temperature supposed to be? What makes the most sense? Um, now, uh, I guess, are there any questions about what we've done with prompting so far? So we'll go ahead then and play around with in-context learning now. How do we do that? Because um, I only showed you some figures, but now actually playing around with it, you'll see uh, that it works. Um, so our experiments so far, they've been zero shot, right? which just means that we didn't give any examples of the task. We just asked the language model something and it told us something back. Um, to improve performance in this prompting setting, it's often advantageous to uh, use in-context learning and provide some demonstrations in the prompt. So we'll go back to this question I used earlier. How many legs does a ladybug have? Uh, zero temperature, because there is only one correct answer to this, to my understanding. Um, and you see that the model will output four. Four is not the right answer. Uh, bugs have six legs. So um, what can we do to fix it? Well, um, here's something that I did was I gave a few examples. Uh, how many legs does a bird have, an octopus, a dog, and give the answers, and then ask how many legs does a ladybug have? Sure enough, now it can understand. So these LMs, uh, what's really weird is like they can be really impressive, but then the mistakes they make are not at all like the mistakes we make, right? And uh, when you when you do this sort of prompt engineering, I think you realize that. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the question is, well, we only let it generate one word. You know, in theory, it could have generated more language and maybe uh, redeemed itself. In fact, like there, there are some recent works in NLP that are starting to say like, we really need to let the language model generate everything it's gonna say and then judge if it's correct or not. Um, with these models, the ones that are these small though, it's like, I think these ones are a lot more likely to actually make mistakes than like the newer ones. The, the newer ones like GPT-4, Sometimes you might say, uh, oh, this was a wrong thing. It generated something wrong. But then if you look at everything it said, you're like, well, more or less this is correct. Um, but here, I think these models are a bit less reliable than GPT-4. So it's like, they can just also just generate nonsense. Yeah, so um, like, uh, do you mean like, the idea that it's generating only one word, does that help it narrow down its best answer? Yeah, so I guess I have two answers to that. So like how, why is this helping? What's, what's making it narrow it down better to the correct answer? Um, you know, one issue that you just mentioned is like, if I just ask a question and I only let it generate one token, um, who knows what it might have generated after. The language model doesn't know I'm only gonna let it generate one token. That does not at all condition what it's gonna do. There's other parameters you can pass in like length penalty and so on to make it more likely to give you a brief answer. Um, so here, uh, it could have said more after four. In fact, I probably could see if it does say more after four. Four, I'm not sure if you're, eh, I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't anything useful. Um, but then the other answer to this is in context learning, the purpose of it is to 
narrow down the answer to something in the correct format of this task. If I give you several demonstrations, remembering that this is just a big model of sequences of words, now that it's seen a sequence of question, answer, it's just a number, question, answer, it's a number, um, that's really going to help condition this uh, model of the, of the language and um, narrow down the search space and give you the correct answer. That's really a good way to describe this in-context learning. It's just helping it narrow down the search space. Um, so that's in-context learning. Um, did I, yeah, so I, we did run all of that. Now the last thing I think we'll look at, oh, second to last thing we'll look at is chain of thought prompting. Um, so chain of thought prompting is a certain type of in-context learning where uh, we go a bit further than just uh, providing question, answer, question, answer. We'll also provide some explanations in our demonstrations of the task. Um, and when a task requires multiple steps of like reasoning or something like that, this can be helpful. And we'll go back to math problems just because this is like the easiest sort of task to expose this uh, property of language models, especially these smaller ones that uh, aren't quite as amazing um, as GPT-4. But um, so let's say we want to ask the language model a math question. And yes, I know. Why are we using language models to do math? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer. There's a lot of people are doing this. But um, we have a multi-step math problem uh, where we want to say, well, what's 20 minus 8 times 2? Uh, if we just ask the language model directly, zero shot, it says 20. That's not the right answer. Um, um, well, actually, by the way, we could do this with more complicated language-based reasoning problems. I'm just doing numbers because it's the most objective problem I can think of. Um, but uh, yeah, so now zero shot didn't work. What if we do few shot in context learning and give some questions and answers, some demonstrations of this task? So I came up with a few problems in this form and uh, inserted them into my prompt and then asked again. This is 24, which is still wrong. Well, what the heck? This in-context learning is supposed to fix it and help it uh, solve the problem better. In cases like this, it's actually beneficial to also provide an explanation, which kind of breaks down the steps of the problem. Um, so in this case, I can come up with some explanations of how I did this problem. Yeah, 4 divided by 2 is 2, and then 32 plus 2 is 34. Um, once I do that, what do you know? it can get the correct answer. It can say, oh, well, 8 times 2 is 16. 20 minus 16 is 4. Uh, because, again, these things are not models of numbers. They're models of language. Uh, presenting things in a way that um, is kind of more narrative, I think, helps. Because, yes, it's probably seen the sentence 8 times 2 is 16 in its training data a lot, whereas uh, it may not have seen this exact math problem followed by its exact answer in its training data. Um, so that's a simple example of chain of thought. So it's pretty cool to see like your prompt engineering, what you're doing there can really dictate how good your outputs are. Are there any questions on chain of thought? Okay, so the last thing I want to show is sort of to kind of bring us full circle because we started, when we did the fine tuning, we kind of had this benchmark data set. We had some pre-existing set of texts and labels and we evaluated the accuracy on it. Um, but I didn't do this here. I just kind of prompted the model. But uh, you might want to be doing some kind of systematic evaluations of your, of your LM as well, even if you're prompting it. Um, for example, if you want to use it to, I don't know, answer questions or um, judge the sentiment of things, whatever it is, um, you need to, you probably want a way to evaluate it, right? And say, oh, well, 95% of the time it's good at this problem. So I feel pretty good about deploying it or whatever for my application. Um, so we'll go back to our original sentiment analysis problem. So uh, we're going to do all this data set setup stuff again. We're going to re-download this SST2 data set. Um, but this time what we're gonna do, just for simplicity and uh, running this a bit quicker, uh, we're gonna just take 200 of the validation data and uh, use that as our testing data. Again, this is just something I'm doing for the demonstration. It's not something we have to do. Um, but now we'll have 200 e labeled examples that we can test the model on and get some evaluation computational metrics uh, on. Um, so yes, same data set as before. Now, uh, it's kind of straightforward to actually evaluate the LLM uh, on SST2 using this pipeline. Uh, we're gonna use this object called a pipeline data set. You can kind of see how I'm using it in here. Um, basically, given a data set object that we already have, we pass it in to the pipeline data set. 
Um, and then we pass that into the pipeline, which is called generator. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it just magically uh, iterates through the whole data set for you. Um, now, a few things that I've implemented here, I don't wanna go line by line because it's kind of maybe, maybe is a lot, but um, I've implemented a few things. Like for example, you can pass in like a pre-processing sort of function into your pipeline data set. And I've done this, uh, I've created this pre-processing function for Fuchsia in context learning. So basically I can pass in um, how many demonstrations I want. Is it uh, zero, is it two, four, eight, 16? Um, and then it will append, uh, prepend uh, those sort of demonstrations of the task um, sampled from the training data uh, uh, into my prompt. Um, so all this code is gonna do is evaluate uh, the model, the LM, by prompting it on 200 testing examples of sentiment analysis. Um, and it will do this given two in-context learning shots, they call it, demonstrations, four shots, eight shots, and 16 shots. Um, and uh, I guess one question I didn't uh, answer yet, you might be wondering, well, we're prompting the language model now. We're not uh, fine tuning it and have a very specific layer to get these specific numbers out. Um, so how do we actually convert the outputs from the language model to what we want in our task? Um, so in this case, what we did was um, if the model generates the word negative, let's just say, yes, it predicted a zero label. If it generates the word positive, uh, we predicted a one label. If for some reason it generates something else, uh, we'll just say it's negative by default. Um, there are a lot of different ways to tackle this sort of challenge. Um, I think I actually uh, went over some earlier in the lecture part. Um, and this is maybe not the best way, but it is the easiest way. So um, this is how we can kind of facilitate this benchmark evaluation with the language models. Now uh, we can press play. In fact, I should have pressed play before because it might take a minute. Um, well, it's actually not too bad. Everything running okay, seems like. Oh, I forget. Okay, so this bar is going to happen, I think, four times. We're gonna have to wait for it. So, yeah, I'm on the second, or on the third one, rather. No, the second one. <laughs> the the code for this stuff generates a lot of stuff. You have to learn to pick out the, the important stuff to figure out where you're at. Um, but anyway, that will take a few seconds. Um, by the way, I guess I mentioned like there are a lot of different ways to do this like mapping of, you know, the word negative means negative class, positive means positive class. Um, another way you could do it is actually dig into the model's probability distribution that it's creating when you prompt it. Um, and then just compare, well, what was the probability of negative being generated or what is the probability of positive being generated? And then you don't even have to worry about if the language model generates an unexpected word. Um, you just dig right into those probabilities and uh, see which one is bigger. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, I guess, uh, there are many different ways to solve this problem. Um, I tend to think this is like the, the, the best way, even though it's a little bit complicated. Um, but yeah, I guess those are the sorts of things as you do more experiments with them, you'll uh, figure out. All right, where am I? I'm still on the third run. One thing I might as well say while I have a few seconds is, um, and one thing we haven't really had to deal with in CoLab, so I talked a little bit about, well, what are all these different computing environments you might wanna use? Um, another thing you have to keep in mind is for some of these computing environments, they're not quite as nice as CoLab in the sense that uh, they won't already prepackage themselves with all these packages in Python that you would want. Um, so in a lot of those settings, like uh, especially like uh, if I wanna use AWS or Great Lakes, um, you're gonna have to set up your own virtual environments using tools like Conda or Poetry. And if those mean nothing to you, just click on these links and have a look and you'll learn how to do it. But if you've used Python, you're probably already familiar with these sorts of uh, dependency management tools. Um, but that's another thing you'll have to learn as you're kind of figuring out what is your setup for uh, using these LMs. Um, 
Another thing too is if you want to use like a Jupyter notebook like we're using in CoLab, uh, you'll need to ensure that your environment you create with Conda, Poetry, whatever, can actually be used in the notebook. Um, and I linked an article that I always end up referring back to when I have to do this because it's not as straightforward as you would think. Um, but yeah, those are just some pointers, I guess, for uh, once you go into whatever hardware infrastructure you have and trying to make this work. Um, all right, let's see where we're at. Looks like it's just finishing up. So what I wanna see and what I guess what we're gonna plot out is um, how does the performance change as we have more and more shots, more and more demonstrations of this task. Um, okay, so mine just finished. Um, if yours didn't, uh, that's okay because I'm gonna show you the plot of mine. Uh, just scroll down to here. Um, and what you can see is, oh, this just barely doesn't fit. Okay, uh, what you can see is that the more demonstrations you give, I only did two, four, eight, and 16, just to be quick. And you can kind of see this pattern that more or less the performance is going up the more demonstrations you give. Um, sometimes they might not be perfectly monotonic like you see here, but um, in general, more demonstrations is good. Uh, there's a lot of uh, AI works in in-context learning that show a graph like this in their paper because they, that's kind of what you want. If you have something that's capable of in-context learning, this is the sort of thing you should see when you're giving more and more in-context demonstrations. Um, yeah, and uh, also, I guess it's worth noting too, see the accuracy, the testing accuracy is like almost 100%. So. We trained a model, we did all this effort before uh, with uh, GPT-2, and all we had to do was prompt the model to get almost perfect performance. Um, of course, these results are kind of apples and oranges. Like, um, they're two different language models with different pre-training data, different number of parameters, um, and there are so many factors when it comes to applying these models uh, in fine-tuning or prompting that it's not a direct comparison, but you can, I think, this probably demonstrates how powerful these language models have gotten, where I don't even need to train on the task anymore. Let's just uh, throw it right at the language model and instantly get really good performance. Um, it's pretty impressive stuff. Um, so I already kind of went through this as I had time. So I guess if you are interested in like setting up your own sorts of uh, infrastructures and things in your labs or wherever, and you wanna figure out what's the best way that I can use language models, um, please like feel free to reach out to me. I guess I showed my Twitter earlier. I don't know uh, if I have, if my email's anywhere out there, but I'm the only one with my name here. So just search Shane Storks in, uh, in your UMIS Gmail account and I'll show up. Uh, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to help. Um, and yeah, I guess acknowledgements. By the way, uh, some of the content in this tutorial was adapted from some other very nice tutorials for different aspects. Um, so if there's one aspect that you really liked and you wanna learn a bit more about, have a look. Um, but that's all I have. So I guess I will open it up for some final questions, discussions. Um, thank you all. Yes. still not ideal. Okay. So anything else I can do? Um, that's a good question. I guess, so you said, all right, I, I've used all my training data, I have searched through the hyperparameters and the performance just still isn't good. What do I do now? Um, so I guess this hyperparameter searching part, I think you'll find is like, it's actually so complicated to really get down into it that it's, for most language-based tasks, if you're using pretty good and new language models, I think I, it seems like you're probably going to do okay. Uh, at some point, there might be a maximum level of performance you get to, and at that point, you might have to think about, I guess, like, okay, if I'm only prompting a language model, do I have to fine-tune it? If I'm fine-tuning it, but I'm only using one classification layer, maybe I add more layers. Um, Maybe, yeah, maybe I need to use a different loss function, maybe some different intermediate uh, activation functions, if that makes any sense. Um, 
is kind of just this process where you have to continuously troubleshoot until it gets better. Um, and you know, if it doesn't, I mean, that might, that could indicate that you just have a really hard problem that the LMs can't solve. But I'm finding today that like, that's so rare that you have a problem that the LMs just can't solve in one way or another. So yeah, I don't know. It's like a, it's a whole troubleshooting skill, I guess you build. See, so, so I, uh, when you run this, um, our, uh, I think it's a fine tuning or low run tu tu uh, tuning. Mm -hmm. So the accuracy is like 0 0.86. So generally speaking, is that like a good, uh, good model? Getting uh, accuracy uh, uh, 0.86, is that a good model? Um, it, I guess the answer to that question of, you know, is 86% accuracy like we saw in fine tuning, is that a good model? It depends on the task, right? If um, this is like maybe a low stakes thing where you're gonna use the model to annotate a bunch of data and then double check it with humans anyway, maybe that's fine. If this is like a high stakes task, like you're, I don't know, I, I'm gonna think of the most problematic thing I can think of is like, I don't know, trying to classify if someone's getting a job or something like that, um, then 86% accuracy is probably not going to cut it. So I think um, it really depends on your task, uh, is the first thing I think of. Um, and in our case, I mean, we saw the model converge, so it's like, this is the best we're probably gonna get with this specific language model. If we use a bigger language model, like OPT, 60 billion parameters, uh, maybe we can get even better performance. So uh, uh, just because we only got 86% accuracy from GPT-2 uh, doesn't mean we can't get better performance by you know beefing up whatever approach we're using. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, one more question here. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so um, from your use cases, um, ha have you found a use case where you could use uh, transfer learning and um, what what impact will that have on performance and if, if actually that's possible with LLMs? Yeah, so transfer learning, I guess, is um, basically when we fine tune the LLM that is in a sense, transfer learning, right? Because we have this pre-trained language model already that's seen like so much of the data on the web. And then we take it and we apply it to our specific task and we train it. Um, so if you're thinking of transfer learning, like in the sense of like, you know, in computer vision, we have ImageNet and so on. Like um, that, that's basically what transfer learning is for these language technologies. Um, when it comes to specific applications of transfer learning, it's like, honestly, like, m in my own research, I've been able to fine tune language models on a variety of different like reasoning tasks with different sorts of complicated multi-layered architectures. And just starting with that pre-trained language model as sort of the foundation of that uh, is always helpful rather than trying to train it from scratch. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Fair enough. This might be a, a rather large question, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. Um, can you discuss what, where the overlap is between fine tuning and retrieval augmented uh, approaches and where they're complementary, where you want to use one as opposed to the other? Um, yeah, so the overlap between fine tuning and retrieval augmented approaches. I'm actually not, I guess I'd be curious what is a definition of retrieval augmented for you? Because there's a few different types of approaches I've seen in NLP. Uh, so in, in some of the work that I've done, I'm actually using the language model more as a reasoning um, uh, engine as opposed to having it give me information. So I'm giving mm -hmm. it lots and lots of information based and in having it say this is a good good piece of information to answer the question that's been posed as opposed to answering the question itself. Mm -hmm. So it's evaluating the, val or the, uh, the value of the information I'm giving it and not augmenting it. And in fact, I tell it not to augment this information. I see. So if we're thinking of the sense of like, you know, we want the language model to identify what information is like helpful towards some goal, if I'm understanding right. Um, in fact, there's actually, I, I might have glossed over it very fast, or maybe I forgot, I don't think I covered it. There is a type of fine tuning task you can do where um, basically given some large amount of text data, you can fine tune the language model to 
point out some span of this text that is helpful for whatever reason. I think they usually use it for like question answering. Um, so you can fine tune a language model to do that sort of thing. If you have like the labels, like say you have a bunch of data where you have, I don't know, some large, large passages and you've already annotated some uh, parts of them and then you say, okay, now I have this new passage and I want you to find my most important information. Um, you can fine tune it to do that sort of thing. Um, so I guess I see it more as like a type of task you could fine tune the language model on, but then you could also, in theory, prompt a language model to do this as well and give some demonstrations. Um, yeah, I think I'm seeing it more as like a task setting, yeah. if that makes sense. Oh, I appreciate that. That's good insight. Love it. Hi, and thank you. Um, I just was curious because you mentioned uh, multimodal uh, LLM at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, mentioning that in your lab you were working like trying to apply them to problems. So I was curious if you could uh, elaborate on what kind of problems you're currently trying to solve or working on. Yeah, so when it comes to these multimodal LLMs that can process images or maybe even videos um, and then also generate language about them, uh, our lab does a lot of stuff with like uh, embodied AI, we'll call it. Basically, we want to build the brain inside of a robot assistant. Like, so um, say we're given some situation. Um, okay, one DARPA project we're working on is called Perceptual Task Guidance. So the idea is we want to build a system where someone can wear glasses or a headset of some kind and get some guidance about how to do something, cook something, build something. Um, so we're experimenting, can we use these multimodal LLMs as the brain of this to watch what the user is doing, describe what they're doing, um, and give some feedback on what are they doing wrong. Also like reconciling this with any recipes or s instructions you might have. So um, we're looking a lot in like these sorts of uh, task oriented, maybe sort of uh, robot related tasks when it comes to the multimodal. But then on the other hand, you could also do like image captioning, you could do um, uh, there's some people who also are doing like uh, web browsing agents, which is kind of a cool application. Like show, show the agent your screen and then it will talk to you about what's on the website. Um, there's a lot of possibilities. Okay, I think we can call it there. Thank you so much again to Shane for the fantastic tutorial today. Thank you.